الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقال سبحانه وتعالى بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم يعني من هم أصلا الصحابة رضي الله عنهم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about in the Qur'an that Muhammad alayhi salatu salam is the Rasul of Allah. He is the messenger of Allah. And those that are with him. And this is an ayah from the ayat of the praise of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Where he says, those that are with him, they are harsh on the kuffar. And they are merciful amongst the believers, amongst each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, السابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والإنصار والذين اتبعهم بإحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه The sabiqun, those earlier, that the ones that were ahead, that, that were racing for the good deeds, they were the first, الأولون, the early. From those that made hijrah, muhajirin والإنصار. And subhanallah, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave it open-ended at who are the sabiqun al-awwaloon. He explained from those sahaba that performed the hijrah, muhajireen, and those that gave them nusra, al-ansar, and whoever makes it taba'um, whoever follows them bi ihsanin, in the word of good that they're doing, radi Allah wanhum wa radu anhu. That Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. Many, many ayats in the Quran, they give us the virtue of the Sahaba radiyanu. Al-Mufassir ibn Kathir, he mentions that after both of these ayats, I'm summarizing from him, that these are evidences that the Sahaba, from those that did the hijrah and those that gave the nusrah, that Allah was pleased with them. And as Ibn Hajr al-Qalani, he speaks about where we talked about Jarf al-Ta'adil, those that criticize and accredit the scholars or the narrators of hadith. He says about the Sahaba, kullum adilun, yani they are all of adal, they are all just. And he brings these ayat that those that Allah has praised, and those that Allah has announced His pleasure with, there is no way that somebody after them can come and criticize them. Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim, in their collections of Sahih, they mention the hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلَوْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلَوْنَهُمْ The best of the generations is my generation. Now this hadith muttafaqun alayhi, yani no doubt to its authenticity. That the best generation is the Sahaba radiyana. What about after that, then the ones after them? This is a hierarchical order now. And then the one after them, and then the praise stops there. And this is the first three generations of the Muslims of, in the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obviously there were Ummah before us that had Muslims. But with the Risala of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba, the Tabi'oon, and the Taba Tabi'oon, these three generations, the Salaf al Salihin, are praised here in the Qur'an and Sahih Ahadid. I know you know this. So why am I mentioning this? When we speak about the Sahaba, when we learn about the Sahaba, we need to understand the status that Allah gave them. Why? Because there are some today, who have a personal grudge. They have a filth in their heart. As if these Sahaba يعني, uh, took over their personal property or something, that day and night they work to divide the ummah. Day and night they work to try to cause seeds of mischief. They misquote a hadith, they cut ayah, they cut a hadith, they take weak narrations, they take things out of context. Day and night their concern is how to split the ummah. And how to bring that disunity in the ummah. And how to bring that hatred towards those that were beloved to Allah and His Prophet. And now our da'wah is to the opposite of that. 
our da'wah is to back to the Qur'an. That those that Allah has praised in the Qur'an, how could we ever, ever imagine criticizing them? Even though they were human beings, we don't make them anbiya. We don't make them malaika. Even the anbiya were human beings. But the prophets were protected. And he, the prophets, no doubt, Allah protected them. But people after that will make mistakes. But it is not our place to criticize that. They are the ones that Allah chose. That Allah chose to give nusra to his deen. And when somebody is praised in the Quran and praised in the sunnah, then no doubt upon us is to learn about them, is to uh, make dua for them, to try to aspire to be like them, and to overlook any faults and mistakes and leave that between them and Allah. Now, we've, we discussed Aisha Taradiyanha, and each one of these Sahaba, if we began a series on them, especially the likes of Aisha Taradiyanha, we could go on for months and months and not cover what should be covered. But we covered the major aspects of her life, and we covered her also during the Sira Durus. So today I'm going to begin with Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, his name is Mu'ad, his father is Jabal, ibn Amr, ibn Aus, al-Khazraji, al-Ansari. And from the greatest of the titles that he has been given is al-Sahabi al-Jaleel al-Badr. Yani Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he is from the people of Medina. From the Ansar and from the tribe of Khazraj. But those things are just to get to know him. I mean, what tribe you are, what country you come from, what language you speak, what background, that is just ma'rifah. That's how you get to know each other. You know, if somebody tells me Asadullah, I'd be like, which one? And then we have Alhamdulillah more than one Asadullah here. So then we mention their tribe or their ethnicity or what they do and so on, and we know them. Okay. If I say Amr, which one? Abdurrahman, which one? Yeah. So we get to know people, nothing wrong with that. But what sets him in a place of honor is he's a Sahabi. He is from the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Al-Dhahabi mentions about him from the great distinctions that he has, he's Badri. What does that mean? He was from the Sahaba that participated in the battle of Badr. You know, those that come early in the times of hardship and stand firm, their status is a different status. And we have around 120,000 or 100,000 plus Sahaba. And we have the biographies of more than 10,000 of them that I've seen collected from different books, Al-Isaba and so on. But the greatest of them, the most honored of them, no doubt are those that were in Badr. Why? Because there's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam where he's, can, he's speaking to Jibreel alayhi salatu salam and, he's, and he says, who is the best of the people? He said, the people of Badr. He said, the same is true for the malaika of Badr. Those malaika, those angels that fought in Badr, they are the honored amongst the malaika. And those insan, those humans from the sahaba that fought in Badr are the honored amongst the, the sahaba and amongst the humans. You know the Badri Sahaba, they have a lot of fadail. Many of you may not even know some of those ahkam. How many takbirat do we have in janazah? Four? You know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the Badri Sahaba made additional takbirat. Now this is something most people don't know from the fiqh perspective. When Shaykh Abdul Salam al-Rustami, may Allah have mercy on him, one of the great scholars of hadith and famous for his tafsir, when he passed away, when I was in Janazah, the Shaykh who read, Shaykh Abdul Aziz Nistani, he made more than four takbirat. And everybody thought he made a mistake. You know, people behind, because it was packed. I mean, the crowds were huge, mountain covered. People started saying, ah, look, they put him up to lead, and he made a mistake. Look, he doesn't even know his four takbirat. And, and, and he read it out loud. He read Al Fatiha out loud. He read it out loud. When he finished, there was like a commotion. Everybody, ah, oh, and he told him, calm down. He said, I read it out loud as Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah had recited it out loud to teach you that Al-Fatiha is a part of Janazah. As Abdullah ibn Abbas had done. 
And he said, I made additional takbirat because from the sunnah, for those that are honored as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did, for the sahaba of Badr, he says, I did because I saw nobody on the face of the earth deserving it more than this shaykh. So the people of Badr, they have that honor. Mu'ad ibn Jabr radiyan al-Dhahabi mentioned in Siyar Alam al-Nubala that he is a sayyid, he is a leader. And an imam, Abu Abdul Rahman, his kunya was Abu Abdul Rahman, al-Badri, al-Faqih, al-Qari. He is the scholar of fiqh. And he was one of the Qurra, one of the honored of the Qur'an, the reciters of the Qur'an. And he was a scholar of hadith. Ata, the great tabi'i, said about him, Aslama Mu'ad. Mu'ad ibn Jabr radiyan accepted Islam and he was Thamat Ashr. And he was 18 sana, 18 years of age. Subhanallah, this tells you that Mu'ad ibn Jabr radiyan, who was very young, in comparison to the others when he accepted Islam. And the ulama of tariq, they said he was then around 21 years of age at Badr. So yani when we look at his age, even in Badr, he was very young. Qatada says, Jam al-Qur'an, there were those that collected the Qur'an, al ahda Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Many Sahaba memorized the Qur'an. But those that were well known for collecting the Qur'an, meaning that they would collect the written copies as well. The written pieces of paper, pieces of bone, leather, hide, whatever they used to at that time be able to write on. And they used to be memorized of the Qur'an. So there are many, but from the four that he mentions here, كُلُّهُ مِنْ Ansar, They were all from the Ansar. Ubay ibn Ka'b, and I hope inshallah Allah gives us tawfiq. Someday to study the life of Abu ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu, he is no doubt deserving of it. Zayd wa Mu'ad ibn Jabal wa Abu Zayd. And he mentions these four, that they were well known for the, to be from those that collected the Qur'an during the lifetime of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. In the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, and in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, in a version of it as well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us to take Qudu al-Qur'an min arba'a. Take the Qur'an from four. Now who is the one giving us this advice? Huh? You guys asleep already? We just started. Huh? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is telling us to take the Qur'an and he learned the Qur'an and its understanding from four. The first of them, Ibn Mas'ud, yani Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Then he says Ubay, yani Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Then he mentions Mu'ad ibn Jabal. And Salim, Mawla Abu Hudayfa. And Salim, the freed slave of Abu Hudayfa. These four of the Sahaba, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he instructed us to take the Qur'an and he learned the Qur'an and learn its meanings and its rulings from them. Imam al-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. Ibn Majah in his Sunan, Imam al-Tirmidhi in his Jami'ah has reported a beautiful hadith and this hadith is reported through many asani, many chains. A Sheikh Albani, he collected them together in his Sulsala Ahidut Sahiha, and he showed them to be authentic without a doubt. Even though some of them have differences in wording, but as together, there is no doubt to their authenticity. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, as Anas ibn Malik radiyanu reports, Arham ummati bi ummati Abu Bakr. The most merciful amongst my ummah, upon my ummah. I mean, the one who really feels the pain of my ummah, the one who has that mercy of my ummah, from amongst my ummah is Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiyan is given this great yani, uh, honor. وَشَدُّهُمْ فِي أَمْرَ اللَّهِ عُمَرْ And the strictest and the sternest upon sticking to the orders of Allah, to what Allah has ordained is Umar ibn Khattab. وَأَصْدَقَهُمْ Yani the most truthful and sincere in Haya is Uthman ibn Affan. As Ibn Hajar al-Qalani says, meaning the one who is the most sincere and strict, strict in being away from everything shameful and sinful. Yani, haya here is not just shyness, but also when you have Haya from sins and from wrong. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. أَقْرَهُمْ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ أُبَيْ بْنِ كَعْبِ And the best, the most knowledgeable in the Qur'an, Ubay ibn Ka'b. 
and the afradahum, yani the one who knows the best about inheritance, Zayd ibn Thabit. In some of the narrations, the most, the word with the best judgment as Quda, as Qadi, Ali ibn Abi Talib. وَأَعْلَمَهُمْ بِحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ مُعَادَ بْنِ جَبَلِ And the most knowledgeable of this ummah about halal and haram, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. I mean, look at the, the fadail of this sahabi. وَلِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ أَمِينٍ And every ummah has a trustworthy guardian, an ameen. وَأَمِينٍ هَذِيَ الْأُمَّةِ أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَةِ عَنِي أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَةِ بِنْ جَرَّاهِ And the trustworthy guardian of this ummah is Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah. These are just some, again we could go on and on about the virtues of Mu'ad ibn Jabal Rabyan. And that's very important for us to know. Because when we name our children's Mu'ad, when we hear about the ahadith of Mu'ad, we should know the fadail of Mu'ad. And that's why the great scholars of hadith like Al-Bukhari and others, they would put abwaab in their books of hadith at fadail of Sahaba. Entire chapters, entire books inside their books about the virtues of Sahaba. Regarding his description, Ibn Hajar says about him, Kana Jamilan, Waseeman. He was handsome, good looking. And he says that they would report that he had a light coming out of his teeth when he would speak. In the explanation of what the Arab meant by that is that there was an effect in his talk. And he spoke that which was good. And people when he would speak, they would get affected by what he is saying. And he had large eyes. And he, his eyes were large. When we talk about his Islam, he was from the youth of Medina, the people of Medina. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu from Mecca to Medina to call the people towards Tawheed. And this is something important. Mus'ab radiallahu himself is very young. He's a young Sahabi. And he is sent to Medina to give da'wah and he works on the youth there. And he prepares the young of Medina and the first one of them from Khazraj at least as is mentioned the first one of them to accept at least from the youth of Khazraj was no doubt Mu'ad ibn Jabal Radiyan. And they built a friendship, a friendship that would last a lifetime. And their friendship was based on what? Not that they were the same qawm. Yani one is from the people of Medina and one from the people of Mecca. Not that they're from the same tribe. Not necessarily they even had the same interests in worldly things. But their friendship was based upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, upon a da'wah. And here Mus'ab radiyanhu, he got Mu'ad ibn Jabal with him, and they would go to the houses of the Ansar and call them towards Tawheed. And this is something that we see some brothers quoting at times. They talk about how a jama'ah was sent from Mecca to Medina, and how the Ansar gave them Nusra, and they went house to house. And that's all true. The only funny thing is, they usually use this for just visiting the Muslims. Well, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, and Mus'ab Radiyan didn't go and visit the Muslims of Medina. They went to the Kuffar. And they went to the marketplace of Medina. And they called towards Tawheed. They called the Kuffar towards Islam. That's what they were doing. And you will see that afterwards, and we'll get to that, he is then prepared as a da'i who will go to Yemen and call the people towards Tawheed in Yemen. Mu'ad Radiyanhu was from the people that gave bay'ah to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam tahta shajara, yani under the tree. Those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That verily Allah is pleased with those believers that gave bay'ah to who? To Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam tahta shajara. And we talked about Hudaybiyah and the bay'ah of the people of Medina and the three times and all of that in the Sira Duru. But no doubt, Mu'ad ibn Jabal Radiyan is from them. So repeatedly in the Qur'an, we find that Allah is pleased with them. Mu'ad ibn Jabal Radiyan, who at that young age, he dedicated himself to knowledge. 
And that's why you will find that he was from the people of Qur'an and he was from the people of Hadith. And he was from the people of Fiqh. If you read the books that are dedicated to Qur'an, yani Jam al-Qur'an and Hufaz al-Qur'an and Qurra al-Qur'an and Tafsir al-Qur'an, you will find the aqwal of Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyam. If you pick up the books of Hadith and you see those narrating a Hadith, you will find Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyam on some of the very famous and instrumental a Hadith. And when you find the Kutub of Fiqh, those that go deep like Al-Mughni and Al-Awsat and Al-Majmu' and others, you will find them quoting the aqwal of Mu'ad radiyam. So you find him that he dedicated himself to knowledge. And there is a beautiful hadith that Imam Tirmidhi has mentioned and he has graded to be Hassan Sahih. Others, ulema like Imam Ahmad and others have mentioned it as well. And this hadith is reported from two sahaba, Abu Dar radiallahu anhu and Mu'ad ibn Jabal. And what is their sahih sanadan? So what is zahir, what is apparent is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave the same advice to both of them. And that tells you the importance of this advice. This advice is very short. It's only three pieces of advice. And it is jami' and it is comprehensive. And it's so beautiful that if most times if somebody asks me for advice and I don't really know them to give like advice tailored to their life, I will just use these three. Because this is what we find from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so he gave the advice, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُ Have taqwa for Allah, wherever you may be. That's a beautiful advice. You know, today, too many people are busy with each other. Yani, there is a place for Amr bin Maruf. There is a place for Nahal al-Munkar. No doubt there is a place to invite towards good. Sincerely, wanting good for a person. And there is a place to forbid that which is evil. No doubt to that. And we stand on that. But one of the things we are seeing as a community is this focus on others. And this loss of looking at yourself. And you day and night trying to find people's faults. Trying to say this person is not a person of taqwa. This person is not this. This person is not this. Yani that, that is different from stopping evil. And yani when evil puts his head forth to call it out and to really focus on the mas'ala, on the issue, not on personalities, and to use it to stop harm, not to gain fame, that's a part of sharia, no doubt to that. But when somebody spends hours and hours and hours just watching somebody else just for just to find something, to find mistakes, and they don't they don't spend that time on themselves, you see a, a problem in the ummah. And that's what we see today. Here the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is so beautiful. Have taqwa of Allah wherever you may be. Whether you are in front of people or not. Don't put a fake image. I mean, this fake piety is something dangerous. I'm not saying expose your sins. Everybody sins, keep your sins between you and Allah. But don't go out in front of people and just be like, yes, mashallah, you know, yesterday I finished the Quran, mashallah, three times, in tahajjud, and you know, alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me, and you know, this week, I made so much zikr. And... Khalas, if you did it between you and Allah, Allah knows. Any keep to who you are. You know, subhanAllah, some people, they'll speak English fluently, and when they talk to you, they're perfectly fine. When you tell them to give a lecture, suddenly they get an accent. <laughs> suddenly they forget English, now they need somebody to translate them. Because mashallah, this image. I was in, I'm, not, I'm not talking about people here, yeah, I was in another country. I was talking to a young brother, mashallah, and in another country, not the U.S., spoke English fluent, you know, in their accent, not our accent, you know, everything good. Started to give a talk, and the Buzzards have said that, you know. How'd you get a Pakistani accent? <laughs> You're just talking to me regularly. Like, no, no, 
when we talk like that here in this country, they, they think, you know, mashallah. No, have taqwa of Allah. Who you are, be who you are. You are who you are. And when you sin, follow it up with a good deed for it erases it. I'm trying to go short. I don't want to go deep into the hadith because then we lose the, I mean, the text of what we're doing. And that's important. Even when you have taqwa, even when you're trying, you are going to sin. If you think you, you, know, you don't sin, you know, we had somebody ask me a question after Jum'ah. He said one Christian came to him and said, Christians never sin. They never lie. And Muslims, they're allowed to lie in certain situations like war, to being sulah and so on, right? He said, so Christians are better because we never lie. And in war, you guys, you guys are allowed to lie. So I told him, ask him a question. Have you ever lied? And if he says no, tell him you're lying. And if he says yes, then tell him, I guess you're not Christian. Because that's hypocrisy. Nifaq. It's, it's a lie. Everybody's lied sometime in their life. Maybe you were a kid, maybe you were a teenager, I don't know. But everybody's lied sometime in their life. If you say you've never lied, you're lying. Right? We should be honest. We should never justify that. But we also should be honest to know that we all sin. We all make mistakes. So when we fall into those mistakes, what do we do? We fall apart? Do we just break down? Do we just say, forget it? No. We turn to Allah. We make tawbah. We don't have to kill anybody. We don't have to kill our children. We don't have to blood sack. No, we go and make tawbah. And we ask Allah for forgiveness. And we follow up that sin with good deeds. We try to do more good. So that Allah will erase our sin based on our good deeds. And خَلَقَ الْنَاسِ لِخُلْقٍ حَسَنٍ And be in, in your moral character, in your dealings, the best of manners with people. And you deal with people the best of manners. It's a beautiful hadith because it deals with huqoqullah, with the haqq of Allah, to have taqwa of Him and to not sin. And if you sin, to do good, which is upon yourself, your own huquq, because you don't want to throw yourself in the hellfire. You want to, you want to make sure you get rid of your sins. And the huquq al-ibad, the haqq of the people, to deal with them in the best of manners. Three small lines, short advice, jami'ah. And this is something that Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyanhu, as being one of the narrators of hadith that brought this to us. In a beautiful hadith, and this shows the intelligence of Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyanhu. This shows his thinking. And the Sahih hadith, and there are many very beneficial hadith that have to do with Mu'ad ibn radiyanhu, but they were da'if, there were some da'af, so I left them. I'm sticking to all that which is sahih. He asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, akhbarni bi'amalin, inform me of an action, yadkhulani, that will enter me al jannah into the jannah. Wa yuba'idu ni min al nar And it takes me away from the hellfire. So now look at his question. It's such a deep, he says, inform me of an action that will enter me into jannah and take me away from the hellfire. Any, what more do you need? Something that will enter you into Jannah and take you away from the hellfire. فَقَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ replied to him, لَقَدْ سَأَلْتُ سَأَلْتَ Verily you have asked me an عَذِيمٍ on something great. وَإِنَّهُ لَيَسِيرٌ عَلَى مَنْ يَسَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ But it is easy upon the one that Allah makes it easy for. And that's a beautiful answer, beginning of the answer. That you have asked about something deep, something heavy, something great, something important. But don't think that it can't be done. It becomes easy for the one that Allah makes it easy for. That's a beautiful mindset. That we aim high. We do big things. We try for things that are hard to achieve. And we recognize that it's a challenge. But we don't despair or give up because we say if Allah makes it easy, then nobody can make it difficult. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he answered him, and I numbered these amal, these actions. The numbering is not in the hadith, that's from me, just to benefit you. 
تعبد الله ولا تشرك به شيئا worship Allah and don't make shirk with Allah with anything this is two right one تعبد الله worship Allah make عبادة of Allah and then that is coined with do not make shirk with Allah with anything now, now, interestingly, right? What did Rasulullah Sallam begin with? Aqidah. The belief. These are a part of the belief. That if you want to enter Jannah and be saved from the hellfire, what is the first thing? You don't make shirk. You don't go to Qubur. You don't ask awliya. You don't say, Ya Ali. You don't say, Ya Abdul Qadir Jalani. You don't make dua to other than Allah. You don't say, Jesus. You don't go out there and worship monkeys. No, you worship none but Allah. That's the first. Second, you don't make shirk at all. That is with anything. Shay'an, yani anything. Not awliya, not anbiya, not ulema. Nothing. You worship none but Allah. Tuqimus salah, wa tutiwa zakat, wa tusum al ramadan, wa tuhajj al bayt. Then those that are other faraid, we see from the five pillars. So three, four, five, and six. Huh? Establish the salah. What is the first action here from the physical actions? Ibadah is only for Allah. It's your aqidah. You don't make shirk. Part of your aqidah, your belief. From the individual actions pointed out, what's the first one? A salah. And that's very, very important to know. That salah, your five time fard salah is non negotiable. That is something you cannot falter upon. Everything else, maybe we have struggles, but that those five fard salawat upon their time, you should make in your mind that, that that's like breathing. Can't do without. Then to give your zakah, to fast the month of Ramadan, to make Hajj to Al Bayt, Yani Bayt al Haram. Now, these are faraid. So what after aqidah, what did Rasulullah mention? The obligatory things. And then he tells them, and, and again there are some difference in narrations, where he tells them that, do you want to know more which will benefit? He says, yes. He said the sadaqah extinguishes. Sadaqah, it, it, extingu- in some of the rawayat he mentioned, so the fasting is a jannah, is a shield, as number seven. Some of them mention sadaqah first, but we'll take this as number seven, nafal fasting. Why? Because the fourth fasting is already mentioned for Ramadan. So now we get to nawafil. So aqidah first, the faraid, then the nawafil after that. That's important to understand. Some of the people are ummah today, they are concerned about nawafil, but they're negligent about aqa'id and fara'id. This is something important. I was just in another state, I won't mention where. And we met a lot of different people. And some of them, they were like, these brothers here, mashallah, they give so much sadaqah, and they're giving this much millions of dollars, and they raise this much for this country, and this much for this organization. But they don't make salah. <laughs> I'm like, why? What's tell them to make salah? Man tarku salah, faqad kafar. My brother, so what? They give millions of dollars. So what? They can keep the millions of dollars. They don't make salah. It's kufr. These brothers, they want to collab with you. My brother, these brothers are calling out to graves. How can I collab with them? It's shirk. Brother, it doesn't matter. They've done a lot for the community. They feed people. They have this huge masjid. And they, they, they help the homeless. I mean, this brother was, they help my charity. Don't talk about da'wah. If there is homeless people in your city, you can't give da'wah. <laughs> what? Where did this usul come from? Some drunk guy doesn't want to get a job, so now I'm not going to worry about people going to cover. <laughs> you know, I mean, people's mindsets are flipped. No, we never compromise on aqidah. We establish the faraid. 
And then we help the needy, we help the poor, we do all those things, all a part of Islam, we love it. But, but you gotta know the priorities. So here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then talked about fasting, being a shield. Sadaqah puts out the, the sins or wipes out the sins, extinguishes them like water does fire. Sadaqah, this nafat. Of course you have to pay your fard, zakat, that's already mentioned early. But that's not enough. If you're worried about your akhirah, then you need to increase in your sadaqah. You don't have to tell people about it. You don't have to be like, brother, me, 10,000. And sometimes it's good to encourage others. But even if you do it hidden, do it. Allah knows. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on the night talked about praying in Jawf al-Layl, and he establishing that nafal, that, that non-obligatory salawat in the middle of the night. And that's a really beautiful salah. And a salah that if you can, keep it secret to yourself. I mean, sometimes you have to make wudu, whatever people hear you, but try to keep it between you and Allah. Because that's, that's a secret. That's why it's so beautiful, it's in the darkness of the night. Where nobody sees you. Where nobody knows, but Allah knows. And when you make dhikr, when you make dua, when you give sadaqah, when you pray, and it is only between you and Allah, this is a sign of your iman. You know, when you, when you do things in front of people, nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying, and you don't come for fard salah because you're like, I'm not doing it for sure. No, no. You need to go for salah and jama'ah and do your best. I'm not, that's true. But your knee is always a struggle there, right? And he, I remember when I used to go for umrah at times and nobody knew. And he, I would go and I'd be by myself, wallahi, the best umrah I had. <laughs> Now it is difficult, you go for Umrah and people are like, I think I know you. <laughs> so then your struggle begins. When you're with your family and friends and things, it's a struggle. You're me, inshallah, you, you will overcome that struggle. But when you have it where there is nobody knows, and you never tell anybody, that's a beautiful thing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he continued, and this is the 10th, he said, do you know the head, the pillar, the imad of this deen of salah. And the peak of it, jihad. And jihad, qital, fighting is a part of Islam. I know people don't want me to say that today. But I'm not going to be ashamed of anything in Islam. Yes, in the Quran, in hadith, we have to defend our lands. And when we have an amir, when we have a situation where, where, where we have the, 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 the shurut are there, then there is even jihad talab, Part of Islam, we never deny. But according to the Quran and Sunnah, and the way the great Imma and Ulema with the rules and regulations have set, and he told him that the foundation of all this, فَأَخَذَ لِسَانِهِ And Rasulullah in this hadith, he illustrated, and it's a beautiful way of teaching with physical action. You know, your senses, you have hearing, you have sight, you have thinking. When, when Rasulullah ﷺ at times would utilize more than just the hearing. Sometimes he would just say, sometimes he would physically do something to help you understand. And here, he took the tongue with his hand. He said, Kuf alayka hadha. That, yani control this. Or take control, or be mindful of this. And that's a beautiful, beautiful piece of advice. Today, one of the diseases that we see is we don't take our words to be part of deen. Meaning we'll be sitting in the masjid waiting for salah in the first self and we'll be backbiting somebody. You'll be sitting, I was in the haram, in Mecca, in Ramadan. Ajeeb, <laughs> And it was my first time that I was in Mecca in Ramadan. And we're going to make Qiyamul, I mean the Taraweeh, the Qiyamul Lil, after Isha. And there were people there watching videos, laughing. And subhanAllah, those people, they were sitting there and they were speaking in, a, in an accent of Urdu. And they were backbiting the Imam of the Haram. You <laughs> know, I, I speak the language, so I understood it. 
And when we pray, they didn't pray with us. This is from my own eyes. I'm not, it's not a YouTube video. It's not TikTok. They didn't pray with us. They sat there watching like Indian dances on their phone. And after the first rakatain, I couldn't take it. <laughs> my, my, my temper, you know. I told them, what are you doing here? They said, our sheikh, some Sufi in India told us that the imam of the haram, he's a Wahhabi, you can't make salah behind him. <laughs> I told them, why'd you come here then? <laughs> Should have prayed in that grave or something, wherever you were at. They said, we want to come for Umrah. But he told us, you can't make salah behind them. So we're not going to pray behind them. So I told him, okay, so you think, it's more, your Sufi Shaykh told you, that it's more virtuous for you to fly to Mecca, and sit in the saf, breaking the saf, because you're not making salah, watching music and videos of dancing, backbiting the Imam of the Haram while we're making salah. Really? <laughs> So, so this is the tongue. Today, it has become something we don't take as something to protect. Mu'adh bin al-Jabal radiyanhu asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that will we be taken to account for this, the tongue? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it's a longer hadith. He told him, is there anything that the people will be thrown into the hellfire face first because of it more than the tongue? Meaning the, the, the worst thing that takes a person or the most common reason for somebody being thrown face first in the hellfire is the tongue. Lying, backbiting, buhtan, slander. Harming somebody with your tongue. Hurting people's feelings amongst the Muslims with your tongue. Things that today, if you see somebody... Imagine if you saw somebody here in the masjid with a, with a beer bottle and he pops it open and starts drinking. I can tell you four or five brothers here that will swoop him up and he'll be on the other side of that parking lot. Learn how to fly. Right? As should be. But the same place where somebody is sitting in the same masjid backbiting, everybody is zip. Nobody takes that as a sin. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyanhu to Yemen. Remember Mus'ab radiyanhu went to Medina he prepared the people of Medina now that person is a da'i now he's going to Yemen and he's going to teach the people and he's going to call them towards Tawheed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are many ahadith, I'm going to summarize from them. He walked with Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, and Mu'adh radiallahu anhu is a young man. I told him he's very young. Rasulullah had him on the camel, and Rasulullah sallallahu was walking on the feet, holding the rein with him going out of Medina. Look at the humbleness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the messenger of Allah. He is in his... Later 50s at this time. And this young man is sitting on the camel and Rasulullah is walking with him. He didn't tell him, get down. How dare you? No, he's walking with him. And he tells him that when you come back, you will come to my masjid, you will see my grave, but you won't see me. And this is from the Things that Rasulullah sallallahu was informed that his life was going to be over. And we know this from the tafsir of Idajah and Nasrullah wal Fat. As Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu made tafsir of it. So Mu'ad radiallahu started to cry. He loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa more than they loved their own parents. More than they loved their people. We're going to go over today. And out of, his, out of his pain, he started to cry. And this is the love that many of us have lost today. When we see statements from people that claim to be our leaders, saying that we believe that in America, 
not at other places, that's their clarification. In America, people have the right, we defend their right to insult the Prophet ﷺ. What Muslim can say that? Who gave you that right? Did Allah give you that right in the Qur'an? Did the Prophet ﷺ give you that right in his sunnah? Did the Salaf al-Salihin say this? No? Where did you get this idea? You want to defend freedom of speech? You want to defend people talking about their LGBT, XYZ, boyfriends and, and mothers and, and, and whatever? And for that you're going to sacrifice us defending the Rasul alayhi salatu salam? No, never. Look at the Sahaba and their love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he gave him some advice and I'm going to summarize here. He told them one, that worry not because the people of taqwa will be closest to me. Like don't worry, even if you don't see me when you come back, there is an akhirah, there is a hereafter and then, and if you are from the people of taqwa, it doesn't matter if you are not Qur- Qurashi and you're not from Mecca and this, you will be the closest to me. So if you want to be close to me, increase your taqwa. That is istidlalan from that advice. And he told them to make things easy for the people that aren't difficult. Some people, they just like to make things difficult. Within the bounds of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, never violating the Sharia, to make things easy for people. And he told them, be united and don't, don't be in disagreements amongst yourselves. Because he was sending Abu Musa al-Ashari as well to, to Yemen. But if you go and now you're attacking each other and you're supposed to be the people of the Sunnah, what are the people of Yemen going to see? And that's the thing with us today as well. At least those that are striving to be on the Sunnah, we need to be united. And if we have disagreements, we can take things to a side and discuss them. But at least... We need to present the Qur'an and the Sunnah in a united manner. As Rasulullah sallallahu advised the Sahaba. And he said, give glad tidings to the people. Don't just be cursing them all the time. Don't just be out there saying, you're, you're going to hell and you're this and you're that. Give glad tidings. The beautiful advice of Rasulullah sallallahu was taken by Mu'ad ibn Jabal, who was a da'i and later a governor. In the time of Abu Bakr radiyallahu, Mu'ad radiyallahu wanted to go for jihad, to qital, to fight against the Romans in Sham. Amr Radyan, as Abahabi mentions, he told Abu Bakr Radyan, don't send him. Because he's from the people of Quran. He is from the people of knowledge. And if he goes out and he becomes from the shuhada, it will be good for him, but we will lose that resource. Amr Radyan liked to keep the people of knowledge around him, to give advice to the leaders. But Abu Bakr Radian told him, this is a man wanting to serve the deen of Allah, to fight in his cause. How can I stop somebody from good? So Mu'ad Radian, who he went, and he served the Muslim Ummah in Sham, and he used to give advice to the leaders, and he used to teach, and he used to fight. And he was with Abu Bakr bin Jarrah, when the plague, Ta'an, the, 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 the plague broke out. And at that time, he used to tell the people that know that whoever dies because of it, being patient will be shuhada from the hadith. And he would ask Allah to accept him and his family as shuhada. Like, amazing. Like, you know, we just went through COVID. Nobody wanted COVID, right? Nobody was like, Ya Allah, let me get tested. No, right? And because it's difficult for us. I, I mean, I, would, I didn't want it. Right? But the Sahaba, the Ajib, he said, I want to be shaheed, and if I don't become shaheed in the battlefield, I can't lose my, my opportunity to be shaheed. And Ibn Hajar, he mentions this. He said, when he, his family got affected by it, and they were patient, they didn't run from it, and they died from it. And when he got this plague, it would, you would get these bubbles that would come on your skin. And when he got it, he said, I wouldn't trade this with anybody if they wanted to buy it from me for the world because this is going to be my mean for sh- becoming a shaheed. Haji, like, when I read this, I, like, my mind was like blown. Like I couldn't understand that mindset, how different their thinking was. And he died at the age of 33. He was very young. And when he was dying, he was crying. So the people in the current day Jordan, the people there in Sham, it's called Sham at the time. They told him, why are you crying? Are you crying because you got the plague, because you're going to die? He says, no, I'm crying because I will miss three things. Ah. 
Be honest. You guys paying attention still? Huh? So I still got you guys? Nod your heads. I want to make sure you're not asleep. If you were going to die tonight, may Allah protect you all, give you a long, pious life with me. But if you're going to die and you had to list what you would miss from the dunya, video games, TV, chocolate, ice cream, food, spousal relations, whatever, sunset, children, wife, for the people upstairs, husband, right? Whatever, just think through your own mind. You don't have to tell me, think through what would be. Ma'ad ibn Jabal said three things. The thirst, he said, this is what I'll miss. He was crying. He said, the thirst of fasting in the hot day of the summer. I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you, that not me. <laughs> like, I'm not going to fake it. Like, oh yeah, me too. Come on. He said, the long prayers in the winter nights. So the three things that he would miss, the long prayers in the winter nights, and the bended knees of sitting amongst the students, taking knowledge from the people of knowledge. Right now some of you are, oh my back hurts, my knee hurts, I can't believe he's gone over five minutes. You know some of the Sahaba, they gave a dars, they delayed Maghrib, to the time of Isha and Jama'ah because of the importance of dust. The Sahih narration, I can show it to you. They weren't travelers. They made Jama'ah bayna salatain because of the importance of knowledge. This is the three things he mentioned. And he gave advice to his son. And because my sons are here, I will mention this as his advice and my advice to you. He said, Oh my son, at this is the time of his death. He said, pray and never be lazy with your prayers and pray aid each prayer like somebody who is leaving and will never have that opportunity again. Meaning pray each prayer like it's your last prayer. Never be lazy with your salah and never take salah like something to put out of the way. Pray each prayer like it's your last salah. And he says, no that the believer dies between two good deeds. The mu'min, his death comes between two good deeds. The believer, the mu'min dies between two good deeds. One is the good deed he did, and second is the good he did he intended. The believer dies between two good deeds. One, the good deed that he just did, and he dies before the good deed that he intended. What does that mean? That the believer, the mu'min is always striving to do good. And he always intends, when he makes his plans, he makes his plans for good. So you, 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 you do a hajj, you don't go, okay, I did hajj khalas, man, I'm done. <laughs> you do hajj, you make your niyyah for your next hajj. You do umrah, you make your niyyah for your next umrah. You make salah, you worry about your next salah. You give sadaqah, you think, how can I give more? You always want to do good. So you die having done your good and you will get the reward of your intention even though you didn't live for it. The believer is always like this. May Allah bless us by following the Salaf of Salihin in their beautiful example. This is Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu who passed away at the age of 33 in the land of Sham and set that beautiful example for us.